Good morning, everyone. I really apologize for the delay. This is Sanket Sarang from Blob City. I was having problems getting Zoom to start on the computer. I had to uh, reboot the computer. Uh, so sorry about that. We really apologize for starting late. But nonetheless, here we are, and we're beginning a journey on how machines learn. And let's see, I'm gonna actually do this a little differently. Give me a second. Okay. Yeah, now I can see the presentation and your chat at real time. So please do feel free to ask me any questions during the session. And let's get started. The session is all about how machines learn from data. So we've all covered topics around artificial intelligence and machine learning. We've all learned some tips about AI and ML. We've already seen what is the difference between AI and ML. And we've done this in the previous sessions. But just as a recap for everyone else, uh, artificial intelligence is basically intelligence that is exhibited by machines, which is machines doing functions that essentially mimic cognitive functions of the human mind. So if a machine does something that's very, very similar to how a human being would do something, we call it artificial intelligence. And in the other hand, if it's machine learning, then what we are saying is we are basically giving machines the ability uh, you know, to learn from, uh, from your data. So we are presenting data and we are then seeing uh, what, how machines can learn from it, okay? And that is all, that is the difference basically before uh, AI and ML. So Shivandu says, lol, good joke, Love City. Actually, it's not a joke. So anytime a machine does something that's basically mimics human intelligence, that is what we call AI. So like the automation, automatic transmission in your cars, for example, is actually AI. So moving on, here's a quick difference again. This is a simple slide, which gives you AI and ML and ability of machines to carry out tasks that are considered smart, whereas machine learning is all about giving machines and then figuring out uh, how, how machine learning gets, you know, uh, how, how machines can learn from data. Essentially, because the very fact that you can learn from data itself is considered intelligent, machine learning is actually 100% subset of artificial intelligence. So when you look at AI and ML, we always consider AI and ML side by side, right? And uh, what we basically do is basically you have ML, which is part of AI, which is part of AI. We had covered this in the first session. Now, deep dive into some ML strategies, right? Let's look at how actually machines learn from data. So when you present data, we want to see how machines learn from this data. And that is what today's session is all about. It's all about figuring out how are machines going to learn from the data we present to them. So one of the aspects of machine learning is supervised learning. And in supervised learning, all we do is basically we have some reference data and we want to have a machine learn from this reference data to achieve a specific objective. And the objective, uh, yes, Shivandu, sorry, my bad. I actually missed the joke. So yeah, my bad. So yeah, so back to supervised learning. So we're gonna basically present um, uh, machines with data and we're gonna expect them to learn. Now the learning can either be supervised or it can be unsupervised. So, and there are others also, which is reinforcement. So we will predominantly be uh, covering three topics, which is supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Now let's start with supervised learning. In the case of supervised learning, what we really do is essentially we pass in any input and then we get, we have reference data against that input. 
and then we get a specific uh, output against this reference data. Now I'm going to see if I want to this section. I want to do it in full screen. So one second. Okay, so we basically take input and we have uh, reference data that we have, and then we have the uh, specific output along with the reference data. Now, what does this actually mean in a sense is you basically pass on an input which goes into an ML system. Right, and this ML system is a machine learning model. It could be any type of machine learning model. And we have reference data then that goes along with the machine learning model. So what that means is we're combining the input data with the reference data. And when we combine this, it goes to an error function that we see here, right? And this error function is essentially comparing any input that you have in the ML system with the reference data that you have to get your error function. And this error function then allows for a training uh, to be conducted for your machine learning model. So this training that you then conduct for the machine learning model goes into the ML system back again to train the ML system. So step one in training of any supervised learning algorithm is you have input data and you have reference data. And both input data and reference data are passed on to the machine learning model at the same time. So they are basically passed at the same time. So is the test data same as the reference data, Anil? So actually, no. So testing data is what we do once we are testing the model, which is a pre-trained model. So we have training data and we have testing data. So anytime you have supervised learning models and you have data, you will split this data into two parts. You will have one part, which is the training data and the second part, which is the testing data. It's usually a common practice that if you have 100 rows of data, you would take 80 rows, which is 80% of your data for training and then 20% of your data for testing. Now we will get to how testing actually works. Now, this is as far as training is concerned, you're passing any input along with the reference. And we will take examples for you to understand how this actually works, right? Once this data is passed in, this data, actually the input data goes into the ML system. It's only the input that goes into the ML system. The input produces an output by the ML system. So the machine learning algorithm is essentially producing an output at this point in time. Uh, this output may be totally wrong because you're in the training phase, but that's not a problem, which is where that output is essentially compared with your reference data that you had passed in the first step. And then an uh, error is computed and that error is passed back to the ML system in step four for training the machine learning model. So if you look at all of this, you basically put any input and reference data, pass it at step one. The input goes into the ML system as step two, that produces an output, which is step three. The output at step three is the one that goes out as output, which is based on current training performance. But that output is compared with reference data to find the deviation from reference data. Basically, you're trying to find what is the error associated there. And once we found the error, we basically send back that error into the ML system. And the ML system then can correct itself, which is retrain itself or change itself based on the error function uh, that is that is computed. So now if you were to take an example and I can take a classification model as an example. So I have the photo of a cupcake and I essentially wanna train my model to recognize cupcakes. So let's say this is a machine learning model. It could be an open CV model. It could be any type of, it could be a neural network model, right? So concept remains the same. Whether you use a random forest, you use simple regression techniques, you use decision trees, you use support vector machines, okay? They are essentially all, uh, you know, you, you can use in supervised learning and there are others which are non-supervised also like K-means K clustering is actually unsupervised.
but they all follow the same fundamental principle, right? So the ML system, when we refer here, can be of different, like literally 100 different types. There are like 30, 40 different types which are commonly used. I named a few, which is like your standard linear regression, logistic regression, decision trees, support vector machines, random forest, your neural networks. Inside neural networks, you have like 50 different types of neural networks. There's a perceptron, there's a Kohenian map. Uh, uh, th th there are lots, like I cannot even recall all of the names, right? So, but the fundamental principle remains the same. So when you understand the fundamental principle, uh, you can then basically decide which, which model to use. Now, most data scientists also do not know which is the best model for any type of data. So most data scientists basically try five, 10 different models uh, by the same basic principle. And the structure of code, the nature of code, everything remains the same. It's usually just one line of code that changes, which is you're telling, you're giving an input parameter to a function that basically says what model to actually use. And that's all that really changes. And then based on that change, you can basically use the same fundamental principles. Now, in this case, if you're passing the input as cupcake and you have reference data, reference data is I'm actually giving it cupcake, which is the reference data is actually the text cupcake. That text is called labeled information. So I have a photo of a cupcake, but my machine learning does not understand that this is the photo of a cupcake because it doesn't know what a cupcake is, right? It has never seen one. So I'm showing it a cupcake and I'm giving it reference data, which is basically text input that says this is a cupcake. And the ML system then takes this data and basically learns from it. Once it is learned from it, now if I pass the same photo again, which is I pass the photo of the cupcake as input, and this is now I'm using the model, I'm not training it anymore. So you can see the reference data error function training is actually a little grayed out now because what we're doing is we are now using the model. So there's only input and output. Everything else doesn't exist. There's no reference data when we're testing. There's no training when we're testing. We've now taken a trained model. We've passed in the photo of a cupcake as an input. The machine learning model recognizes it. And so you pass the photo as input. The machine learning model gives us the text cupcake as output, right? So what it's essentially doing is basically it is successfully classified our information, right? So it has basically found out uh, that this photo actually belongs to a cupcake. So Danish is asking, it's like control system. Yes, it's actually pretty much similar to control systems. In fact, some smart control systems that you get in electrical circuits and electronics uh, are actually called artificially intelligent, but because they mimic human type intelligence, but they may not have specifically an AI model uh, or a machine learning model in it, right? Then what is the difference between deep learning and machine learning? Actually, there isn't. So uh, machine learning and deep learning are very similar. Uh, deep learning is a part of machine learning. It's like a subset. Uh, you call it deep learning when you use a very large neural network. So you use a ne neural network which have many layers, which is it's a deep neural network. When you train a deep neural network, you call it deep learning. Training a neural network is itself machine learning. Okay, so when you train a neural network, it's machine learning. When you train a specific type of a neural network, which is a deep neural network, you call it deep learning. Now, deep learning as a term has been established differently because deep learning usually requires a lot of computational resources. Uh, it also requires, it's also much more capable in learning from your data, but it also requires a lot more data for you to uh, train a deep learning neural network. So that's why deep learning is commonly used as a completely independent term, but it's actually a subset of machine learning. So a try and error will be reinforcement or are we combining both here? So try and error is actually uh, not reinforcement. So there are different types of error functions, Anil. Uh, so error function could be just same as figuring out if my classification is correct or incorrect. And if it's incorrect, then I would pass it back. But what's important to understand is as far as machines are concerned, they don't look at this data as images as images. They look at images as numbers. Uh, your output cupcake is actually not a text output of cupcake. It'll actually be a numerical output. So all machine learning models only and only, and this is a strict rule, there's no exception to this. Any ML model is actually a mathematical statistical model and mathematics requires numbers as input and produces numbers as output. 
Okay, so it's the hard and fast rule to any machine learning model, you can only give numbers as input and you can only get numbers as output. And that applies to neural networks and that applies to kind of every AI system that you build. Your input will always be numeric, your output will always be numeric. So how would you get the output of cupcake is numeric? Well, it's simple, you can actually create labels. So you can say cupcake has value of one, apples could have value of two, ice cream could have value of three, et cetera. So your output of the machine learning model would actually be the number one. And if the number one comes as output, then you know it's a cupcake or it could be number two. And if the number two is the output, then you know it could be an apple. Number three is the output, then you could know it's an ice cream. Now, if it's number 1.4, which is what is likely to happen, the machine learning model will actually approximate 1.4 to one and then say, this is actually a cupcake because it's closer to a cupcake than to an apple, right? If it was 1.6, it would have rounded it up to two and basically said, because two is an apple, this thing is more like an apple than actually a cupcake, right? So Abhinash in splitting data, you basically, yes, you do you divide data into training and test data set? Yes, you actually do that. Uh, so training is independent of testing, right? So you can actually use all your data for training if you want. There are cross-validation models available that allow you to train a machine learning model without actually creating a split test data. Uh, this is specifically useful in certain scenarios where you're doing time series forecasting and you wanna take data up to the last minute into your training model because that's the most critical, right? So in, in those scenarios, you might actually not have any testing phase. You might use cross-validation means for testing, which is you pass all your data for training and the model can self-evaluate its accuracy from what it has learned, right? So yeah, and that's what it is. So, but yeah, usually you would basically split it up. Now let's look at this. So what it would mean here in this case is let's say I wanna actually now allow the model to classify itself between apples and cupcakes. So I have photos of apples and I have photos of cupcakes and I wanna train a machine learning model to identify from a photo that I give it, whether it's an apple or a cupcake. Now, an obvious question you might ask is why do I need machine learning and why can I not just put this in a database, right? Can I not just store the photo of an apple in a database and say, this is what an apple looks like and then store the photo of a cupcake in the database and say, this is what cupcake looks like, right? Can I not do that, right? This is really simple, right? Why, why not, right? The answer is very simple, and it's the highlight that you see at the bottom of the screen, which is unseen and unlabeled data. So you want to train it on photos of cupcakes that you have, but then you want to recognize cupcakes or apples from the photos that the model has never seen before, right? So Abhinash is asking, giving one pick ML detect how it divides into training and testing. Uh, Abhinash, no, it doesn't take one pick and divide it into training and testing we will actually, it takes a lot more. So one pick is just one data point. You would actually have to give thousands of pictures for training the model, thousands and thousands of them. And those thousands are actually your training data set. So Google Lens app is somewhat similar to this example. Is that AI or ML app? Yes, actually it is similar to this. So when you're doing any type of learning, when you're actually teaching the model what data looks like, it's machine learning. When you're using the model, it's actually artificial intelligence. So in the previous example, if I go back, right, this phase that you see, wherein I'm giving input and I have given reference data also as input cupcake and I'm training the model, this is machine learning. This phase, when I'm giving input and expecting my output, it actually is artificial intelligence. This is not machine learning, this is AI at work. So ML systems usually produce AI systems, which are giving an output which is mimicking human intelligence. So at this point in time, the output that you're seeing is actually a mimicking of, uh, the, of, of AI, which is, it is mimicking of human intelligence, which is given the photo, a human can recognize this to be a cupcake, but now the machine can also recognize it to be a cupcake, which is near human intelligence. Anil, yes, they can have issues with Google Lens. It's predominantly because of lack of, you know, sufficiency of training data. So in a real life, what you would do is you would have these different photos of cupcakes, okay? And you have different photos of apples. And I wanna just differentiate between cupcakes and apples. 
and I would take, I would label. So first thing is I would take all of these photos and all of these photos would be passed onto my training. So these are all photos that are going onto my training and these are going as labels. Okay. So I'm putting it as cupcake, 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 apple, apple, right? This label is done humanly, which means I, as a person, I am labeling this data as cupcake and apple, and I have humanly checked it and I've humanly labeled it. Okay. So this labeling process is actually a manual process. It's done. Now the label and the photo are passed as input, whereas the photo goes in the input layer, the label goes in the reference data layer, the model then learns from it. Uh, on what is a cupcake and what is an apple. What it's trying to do is basically trying to learn what a cupcake looks like. It's also trying to learn what an apple looks like, right? It's not memorizing a photo. That's why it's not something you can store in a database. It's actually learning from the photo on what a cupcake looks like and what an apple looks like. So once you've passed all of this data and you've trained your model, this is where the trick is. Now I'm passing it a photo that the model has never seen before. Now I have the photo of a cupcake. I've taken it from a stand and three cupcakes in it. I've passed this photo to the model. Keep in mind, the model has never seen this photo, has never seen this type of a cupcake, has never before seen it ever, right? But if the model is well-trained, the model will be able to tell you that this is the photo of a cupcake. So a trained machine learning model is now acting artificially intelligent to tell you that the photo you've passed is actually that of a cupcake, right? So Suresh, yes, if the output is 1.5, you will actually get inaccuracy of results. So if your output comes to 1.5, at times it will actually recognize as a cupcake, at times it will recognize it as uh, an apple, assuming one is a cupcake and two is an apple. If you come an output of exactly 1.5, uh, the model is at that point in time confused because you gave it a photo that's really, really confusing. So the model cannot recognize at that point, and it could give you an incorrect output, one or the other. Uh, different models might give you different outputs. So let's say if you use random forest, maybe it will say cupcake. If you use decision tree, it might say apple, right? So it really depends on the implementation of that model. So can you use, Anil is asking, can we use dictionary here? The answer is no, you cannot use dictionary. The reason being for you to use dictionary, you could use a dictionary only if the same photo of cupcake was to be identified again. So if you made the cupcake as the key, right, the photo of the cupcake as the key, only and only if you got the same photo a second time, you would identify it as a cupcake. If all you had to do was identify if a photo exists in your database, then you wouldn't need machine learning. You would just need a database, right? But in this case, what you're saying is you're, you want to show it unseen data, which is I'm showing you the photo of a cupcake that it has never seen before, and I want it to identify a cupcake. So you're talking about identifying an entry that never went to a dictionary, right? So this entry never was in the dictionary, and I want to see if it's similar to other entries in the dictionary, right? So the process of comparison, how does it do that? Is there a program to check this? Yes, Abhijit, there is, there is absolutely a program to check this. These are statistical models and these are machine learning models. But uh, as part of this session, uh, we want to be getting into the ML. This is giving you a conceptual overview of how machine learning works. Uh, in future sessions, when we actually do decision trees, regression analysis, logistic regression, you will be able to try these examples directly hands-on and you will get an understanding of how that center block, which is the machine learning model, how that center block works. And there are like 25, 30 different types of center blocks. But if you understand this concept very clearly, understanding how that ML actually works is really easy then. So in what format does it store the learning, Rajiv? So this learnings are stored in very, very different formats. So each and every model has different formats in which it stores it. And you can export these formats to file and you can load the model back from file. Does the ML get confused in both Cupcake and Apple in one pick? So Niranjan, yes, it will get confused if you pass Cupcake and Apple in one pick. Yes, it might choose one over the other. The output of this machine learning model will never be Cupcake and Apple. So an ML model, which is a classification model, can only do one class of classification at a time, which means even though you have an Apple and a Cupcake in a single photo, the model cannot tell you cupcake and apple. The model will only tell you one over the other, which means it will tell you it's either a cupcake or it'll tell you it's either an apple, right? So it's one or the other only. 
does that mean a different image of cupcake is presented in input it will ident it will not identify as cupcake actually prakash no that's what we are trying to say so if you use a proper trained machine learning model right so my images of cupcakes were these three i use these three images of cupcake for training once my model was trained i passed this image of cupcake which is a different image of cupcake that the model has never seen before but the model is successfully able to identify it as a cupcake right so that's the way that's the very concept wherein it can recognize data that it has never seen before basically recognize unseen data right so jyoti we have the question from you what does it mean learn learning if application is not storing the pictures and result is not driven from the picture yes so the application is not storing the picture if if i had to store the picture i would only get the photo of the picture what is essentially trying to do is essentially trying to create a statistical model that can identify aspects of shape or color or dimensions etc from these photos and find the difference so an apple for an apple it will learn that it is always red but it doesn't mean cupcake is not red a red velvet cupcake might actually be red right so you can say that the color red biases it towards the apple but a round shape biases it towards an apple but that's not necessarily true but it can find out maybe that there are certain boundary differences in the photo wherein in a cupcake you have these paper mesh at the bottom while in an apple you won't really have that and an apple has a stem which is typically sticking out which is actually a unique stem which a cupcake generally doesn't have right it's learning these things it's learning it in data form we're not going to get into how that data form of learning actually works because that's what we do in the machine learning uh, sessions so there's a separate session on machine learning concepts which actually explains what happens in the internals of the ml our first step is to understand the external which is how how to actually apply machine learning in any given vertical once we understand how to apply machine learning then understanding the internals of the ml model becomes really really easy so can we train ml model to add recognize objects to the dictionary yes zora you can actually do that that's totally possible right so moving on what's essential is the machine learning model is not looking at the photo as a photo for a machine learning model it's actually these data points on an x y axis right so uh this is how the ml model looks at data it is not actually looking at it as the cupcake that you see right it is essentially looking at information in this manner that you see on this on this chart right and you can have so over here the plus could mean the cupcake the square could mean the apple and there's a differentiation line so there's an x and y axis that's created based on the input and then wherever the data point falls right that's your that's your output now the center line the straight line that you see would actually be your 1.5 line right essentially theoretically right let's not get into the details of it but theoretically this is how it works when we get into machine learning we will actually explain all of this and it's really really easy to understand how how it really works but keep in mind it doesn't have to be a linear segregation it could also be a non linear segregation so the graph on the right side shows you like an oval shaped line that oval shaped line would also correspond to the 1.5 which is a center point right so it doesn't have to be visually centered it can be centered across different planes and this this whole data could not would not have to just be two dimensionals it could be three dimensions it could be four dimensions it could be five dimensions now up to three dimensions i know you can imagine this because you add a z axis when you add an extra axis which is perpendicular to x y and z that becomes the fourth dimension when you add a fifth axis which is perpendicular to x y z your fourth axis so all four axes then that becomes five dimensional data now in in the real world in a physical space it's hard to imagine anything beyond three dimensions but in the computer world that is easily possible right so mangesh is asking what will happen if cupcake and apple is kept together it will actually identify just one over the other it can't do both at the same time if i make a cupcake with the shape and the color of an apple how will the training help to identify it can't identify jyoti so if you make the cupcake in the shape of an apple it will actually identify it as an apple there is not much we can do there uh to be all out of all honesty if you actually keep the two far away from each other if a human can't tell, tell the difference most certainly a machine can't tell the difference right so it is relying on visual cues 
It's relying on visual differences between these two objects. If both objects look the same, then it can't really identify. It, 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 it's not always 100% accurate, right? In reference, if you give a search engine instead of data and a way of searching results on the internet to, to the input, will it come under ML or AI? So Shivendu, no, actually, um, it is not ML or AI as long as it's doing a simple search. So semantic search, which is what Google does, uh, Google essentially uses semantic search to find out specific keywords. So it's searching on keywords. Uh, those keywords are not, it's not related to machine learning or AI at all. Uh, they have rankings that are pre-created for those keywords, which is on which, which article should come on top, which should come on the first page, second page, third page, et cetera. That's really not artificial intelligence or machine learning, but it would be AI and ML if you were to give a recommendation engine. So if you were to recommend articles that are specific to the browsing history of a user, then that could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that could basically be a, a, a AI system at that point. Does the trained ML model consist of some temporary DB where it stores all the inputs and keeps on labeling it? Actually, uh, no, the trained ML model does not actually use any database. It does not store the input. So a machine learning model, Ashish, uh, it does not store the input at all. It is just adjusting mathematical weights, as we call it. These are training weights. It is adjusting its weights to better identify and minimize the error, right? But it doesn't save the input at all. So how the reference data is set when machines don't understand photo, only understand math. So it's actually simple. The very photo that you see, the voice that you hear right now that I'm talking, the screen share that you see is actually all numbers in a computer system because the computer system only understands ones and zeros. You can only transfer ones and zeros over the internet, which is binary form. So while it creates a photo for you, the data is actually numeric. It's only ones and zeros, right? So all images, all photos, all voice, all videos can actually be represented in numerical form. And that numerical form is what goes as input. It, you're not actually representing them in numerical form. In, in its natural sense, they are actually numerical data because computers only, only, and only understand one and zero, right? They don't understand anything apart from one and zero. So everything you see on the computer, including YouTube, including Zoom, including my voice that you hear is actually transmitted as ones and zeros. So it is numerical data, end of the day, right? So yeah, a look pick contains both apples and cupcakes. It will actually differentiate one over the other, never give two outputs, right? It'll only choose one over the other. So that was something that has got to do with supervised learning. And in supervised learning, there are other aspects. So what we saw was a classification problem, which is we really looked at data and we had labeled data. We use supervised learning also for regression analysis, which is, let's say I want to find out correlation of how temperature varies by altitude, right? So I want to see how we go up from the surface of the earth, how much is the temperature above the surface of the earth, right? So if I'm at 10,000 feet, 20,000 feet, 30,000 feet, 80,000 feet, right? What would be the temperature? And the temperature will obviously drop as we go higher, but the temperature is affected by certain other conditions, which is the amount of winds that you're getting. Are the winds coming from the north, south, or east to the west? They can be warm, warm air coming in or cold air coming in, right? It can affect the temperature. Uh, the humidity of the region can affect the temperature. Whether it's daytime or nighttime can affect the temperature. So the temperature that you get at a specific altitude is not simply a function of altitude. It's actually a combination of altitude plus humidity, plus sunlight, plus wind direction, wind speed, uh, all of that, right? And all of this collectively impacts what is the temperature at a particular altitude. So a model for that is also, you would call a regression model, wherein you're trying to find the correlation of the input, which is input in this case would be altitude, it would be humidity, it could be wind speed and wind direction and day or night. And then it essentially produces an output, which is the temperature uh, that is the appropriate temperature for that combination, right? So Google uses dictionary, Google, yes, Google actually uses dictionary, but they use more, more complex forms of dictionary, like the Python dictionary won't really scale up to the scale of Google. Uh, so they use key value pairs, but these are put in like a Hadoop type database with MapReduce and they really use complex algorithms for that. 
so it's more complicated than use of a simple dictionary, but it does use dictionaries. In a way, concept is the same, right? How to improve data science? I'm not sure what that really question means, but essentially you just have to kind of conceptually understand this and the more you practice, you'll get better at it, right? Uh, once the model is trained, we can discard the data. Manoj, yes, you don't need the data after the model is trained, right? It, it doesn't need uh, at all, you can discard it. Then Bing search engine is claimed by Microsoft that it is built upon AI and ML, but when you search for the same in Google, you would get same results. Do you have any idea of uh, Microsoft's claims? Uh, I, I don't know, Lakshman, I really don't know if Microsoft uses AI and ML, but I, what I understand is you cannot actually use AI and ML for search. Uh, search is more of a dictionary type of a problem where you want to identify articles with certain keywords. Your ranking algorithm for the articles could potentially use AI and ML, but not the search itself. Search is not. Search is a data engineering problem. Uh, wherein you want to be able to search through very, very large quantums of information at really high speeds, right? And, and to explain this, if you had a Word document and you wanted to search for a specific word inside the Word document, you would just, uh, you know, uh, hit Control F and you could find that word, right? And the Word document would give you all the occurrences of the word. Now, you might have noticed if you have a smaller document, the search is faster. If you have a really long, really, really large document, 100, 200, 300 pages long, the search is slower, right? So it takes a lot of computational power to search from large data. Now, Google is not, Google and Microsoft are not looking at one such document. They, are, they actually have all of the world's information on their servers, literally every bit of it, right? And if you were to search through all of that in like point not, not, not one second, then that's a whole different data engineering problem. It's not really related to artificial intelligence and, and machine learning, right? So moving on, what we saw so far is basically unsupervised learning. And as I said, supervised learning in the other case could be used for both classification, like you want to classify photos, but it can also be used for regression, which is find out the correlation of input to any output that you're giving, right? Unsupervised learning is wherein you do not have reference data. So unsupervised learning works very similar to supervised learning, but it's very different in the sense that you do not have the reference data. So that reference data component that was coming from the bottom up into that circle is actually missing, right? Right, and, and this is not basically, uh, there's no reference at all here. So Mayank is asking search is regularly done by based on data entered in data sets and dictionary. Yes, that is correct, right? So over here, we basically take any input data, pass it to an ML system, and then consider it back for training. So what are we training on, right? So, and how are we starting this? So essentially what you do is you start the machine learning system by something that we call as a random state, right? And, and in case of random state, it basically means we've just random numerical white values, which are random weights that we start with and we pass an input. And this is totally, this is literally random, okay? There's no logic to this. You take any random state and you start with a random state, and then you start passing input uh, into this machine learning model. Now, the objective of that circle there is not actually to find an error because you cannot find an error. You do not have reference data to measure error, so there's no way to find an error. What the circle is really doing is actually it's doing an optimization problem, right? So in case of optimization, right, you want to either maximize the output to a certain number or minimize the output to a certain number. So the simple way to look at it is your number, your output can be in a scale of zero to one, that's it. And it could be decimal values between zero and one. And you want to either bring the output to zero or take the output to one. So you either want to minimize it or you want to maximize it, right? And the machine learning system is basically given some additional inputs on, on what basis to minimize or maximize, okay? So you're actually passing at certain inputs based on the context. So the input has data, plus the machine learning model is given some degree of context on what you have to do, whether you want to maximize it, you want to minimize it, et cetera. And then this model basically starts trying to maximize or minimize that output to a certain value, right? Uh, simply put, that's what it is, right? And where would you use, uh, you know, something like this, right? And Dhanesh, the question is, they, sorry, Devansh, the question is, can AI train itself? Uh, actually, the very fact that you can train a machine learning model is itself called artificial intelligence because machine learning is part of AI, 
right? So if, if, if reference data is missing, how does it get trained? Yes, Aparna, that's a very good question, right? So take this example image, okay? The example images, I have the input and these input is of Greek coins, okay? So imagine you are in a museum and you are a data scientist and a museum has hired you uh, as a data scientist to come and digitize the photos of all of these Greek coins, okay? And I have these Greek coins kept on this black, you know, slate and it's velvet paper. They're they are basically kept on that velvet paper, but I have thousands and thousands of these Greek coins in, in the showcase. Okay. I have thousands and thousands. This is just one slate and I have like other hundred such slate. Okay. So there are essentially thousands and thousands of coins. What the, the museum wants to do, it, it wants to get the photo of each and every Greek coin as individual photo. So it wants to get the individual photo so that you can then start analyzing similarities between these photos, etc. all of that. So I want to pick out individual photos. That's my requirement. Okay. How would you do it? One option is you go and you pluck out each and every coin from the velvet paper and you individually photograph them. That can take you forever, right? Or you take a stencil like this and you photograph the stencil in one shot. Okay. Once you photograph the stencil, now I can pass the image of this stencil to basically a, a unsupervised learning model. And the unsupervised learning model is actually trying to find boundary conditions. Okay. So all it is trying to do is find boundary conditions. So it's trying to identify areas where there's a change of color. Okay. That's all it is doing. My velvet paper at the background is black. I do not have a coin that is black. I know that for sure, right? So if I don't have a coin that is black and my background is black, I can now create an unsupervised learning model that is able to find out boundary detection. Okay, so it's trying to essentially detect boundaries, which is it's trying to detect a color change. Okay, so I pass in this photo to a machine learning model, which is an unsupervised learning model. The unsupervised learning model produces the output, which is the photo that you see on the right side. The photo on the right side is the output of the ML model and the output has these boundaries that are detected. So you can see each and every coin has a outline. That outline is the detection of the coin. Now, there are some errors that you will see, right? Like if you actually notice at coin number three, so on the first row, third coin in the output, you can see on the slight left side bottom of that coin, there's a small yellow dot. I'm not sure if it's visible, right? That yellow dot is actually an error. So it is actually identified an extra coin where one really doesn't exist, right? So it can have errors, but you basically have it. So here, now here, so here without reference data, how could someone trust on output, right? Jyoti, that's a brilliant question. How can we trust the output without reference data? So the output of an unsupervised learning machine, unsupervised machine learning model, must be humanly inspected for accuracy. Okay, so you will have to humanly inspect the output for accuracy. The machine learning model cannot tell you at all whether it is accurate or not. You cannot test the performance of an unsupervised learning model. It's not possible to do that. So to, to figure out if your unsupervised machine learning model has learned the right, it did the right thing or the wrong thing, the only way to actually find that out is by humanly, which is visually inspecting the output. So you have to visually inspect, there's no reference data, so to visually inspect. So if this looks visually, if it looks correct to me, right? And you can, if you look very closely, then at times the boundaries are a little off, et cetera, all of that. And that little error will always happen. There's not much we can do about that, right? But at least we get 90, 95, 96, 97, 99% of it accurately, right? So. As you see, there is no reference data. For me to pass in reference data, I would have to find the boundaries myself, okay? So if I have only these photos of Greek coins, there is no way I can have reference data to tell it what green coin to extract. Now, if I had photos of all the Greek coins in my database, like I had photos of cupcakes and apples, and if I trained the machine learning model to recognize cupcakes and apples, similarly, I trained it to recognize Greek coins, then I could use a classification model to identify all the Greek coins that are in there. But I do not have a photo of all the Greek coins to start with. I do not have a label data to start with. I want to create that data. I want to extract these photos out of the Greek coins. So I pass it into a machine learning model, which is an unsupervised learning model. 
this model can do boundary detection for me. You know, there are various types of machine learning, unsupervised learning models. You can do clustering, you can do boundary detection, you can do a performance optimization. In, in case of logistics, for example, you want to do route optimization, okay, on what is the route that a traveling salesperson should use, what is the route that shipping companies should use, etc. These are all unsupervised learning problems where you're trying to maximize or minimize towards a specific objective, right? So this is an example. Now, interestingly, if you see, the output is actually black and white, whereas the input is colored. So the actual photo of the coin is colored, but the output is really black and white. Why is that the case, right? This is an actual output, okay? This really came from a machine learning model and we show you this model in the course in subsequent uh, you know, sessions where we are actually doing machine learning. We'll show you how this code really works. The output is black and white. Now, the reason the output is black and white is because in case of machine learning, we usually, usually it is not mandatory, we usually convert uh, data from color scale to grayscale. So we actually convert it to grayscale because grayscale images are lighter in terms of data and they work slightly better in, in boundary detection conditions. So we've converted this photo first to grayscale, then passed it to machine learning. Machine learning naturally produced an output that was grayscale or grayscale is also called black and white, right? Now this black and white, uh, data is not really useful to you because you want the original photo, right? So what you do is you don't actually use the output. You take the boundaries from that image. The image will be of the same size. You take the boundary coordinates. It will give you the pixel coordinates of the boundary. And then you go back to your original image and just cut out exactly those pixels using an image processing software. Okay. You don't need AI for that. You have the pixel coordinates. You just use the standard image processing software to go back to your input and pick out those pixel coordinates and you will have the original color photos of your free coins. So yes, Aparna in unsupervised learning, you need human verification. There's no way because there's no way to supervise it. So there's no reference data and there's no reference data, which means the model can't really figure out, right? Now, what does that mean? Let's look at a real life example of supervised learning versus unsupervised learning, right? Now, if I had, if I had the photo of George Clooney, which I have, and I train the model using the photo of George Clooney, and I say, this is, this is what George Clooney looks like, and I've taken his face from several different angles, right? Uh, then I would essentially take all of his face photos and put them in. Now, what we are essentially doing here is, if I want to identify George Clooney across photos, okay, which I want to positively identify him as George Clooney, I would use supervised learning. I would take photos of George Clooney and I would train a supervised learning model saying this is what George Clooney looks like. And then when I pass on faces to the model, the model can actually detect if it's George Clooney or not. Okay, so your face recognition systems, including your Apple phones that do a face ID, your iris scanning, your thumb scanning, your biometric scanning systems, they are all essentially supervised learning systems. You're giving it a reference photo while you're registering your ID, you're giving it a reference. It is learning from the reference. It's learning either your thumbprint, it's learning your face, it's learning your iris, et cetera. It can also learn your voice. Like uh, Siri, for example, actually can learn your voice and can only activate itself on your voice. It won't activate on other voices, right? These are all examples of supervised learning where you're identifying against a positive ID. On the unsupervised uh, side, where you, where you can see actually the photos of George Clooney, what unsupervised learning can really do is it cannot identify George Clooney. So the one you see on the right side, it cannot identify George Clooney. It doesn't know who this person is, but it can tell you that all of these faces belong to the same person. So it can essentially tell you these faces belong to the same person. It cannot name the person for you. It doesn't know the name of the person. It doesn't know who the person is, but it can identify the face and say, these are all the same person, right? And that's what unsupervised learning can do. So what is an actual use of this? Let's say I have a movie reel, right? I have a movie and this is a really, really old movie. and uh, I, I have, I actually have the movie of this reel, right? 
so Jyoti is asking, will facial expression matter? Actually, no, it is, you can actually, it depends on your diverse data sets. If you actually give it a lot of data, even facial expressions won't matter. Uh, it'll be able to identify the supervised learning technology is actually well perfected. So even if you try to make funny faces in front of your iPhone, your iPhone will still unlock, right? They're smarter than that. So uh, it, it, it will work. So essentially, and practical use of unsupervised learning is let's say I have this movie and it's a really, really old movie and I have the reel and I have it in digital form, right? What I want to do is I want to extract the list of all the actors that acted in the movie, right? So this is an example of unsupervised learning in real life, right? I want to get the list of, I want to get all the actors that have acted in this movie. So I have a whole huge repository, right? I might be Warner Brothers, I might be Disney, right? I might be a production house and I have all of these movies lying around and I want to find out which all actors have acted in the movie. So I would use unsupervised learning models and an unsupervised learning model can actually watch the entire two hour film, right? And come back with photos, unique photos of basically photos of all unique faces. It cannot name the actor. It doesn't know who the actor is. To name an actor, it would need supervised. So it cannot name an actor, right? But it can produce a catalog of photos of all unique faces that happened in the movie. Right, so it could essentially extract all the unique faces for me, and then I can check those faces, and then I have to manually go and figure out who this actor is, and I can name the actor by manually looking at the face. That's that job a human being has to do. Another example of unsupervised learning is let's say you're sitting in a Super Bowl, you're sitting in an IPL match, okay, and you're sitting inside the stadium. There are cameras, security cameras, that are actually capturing your faces, right? They can capture all the faces of all the people who entered the venue and they can look at the security footage. They can look at the footage of people sitting in the stadium stands and they can extract all the unique faces that are present in the stadium. So there could be 40,000 people, there could be 80,000 people, there could be 1 lakh people and it can extract all unique 1 lakh faces. And these unique faces could then be compared with known criminal databases but in the criminal database is actually supervised learning where you have the photos of known criminals. And then the database can essentially immediately tell you if an identified criminal is actually present inside the stadium, right? So then you can make basically go and make an arrest. That's what it means, right? But you can essentially do that. So airports do this very often when you're walking into the airport, the security cameras that you see, all the CCTVs, they're actually using unsupervised learning to extract the faces of people. Then they compare those faces after they've extracted the face, they compare that face with uh, data that you have of known faces, which are faces of people that are known criminals. And you can compare this data and, and identify a potential criminal, right? So unique face, unique expression, Akshay. So actually Akshay, all the accuracy will always depend on how diverse your information is. So if you pass it more information of more different types of faces, it will be better for the model, right? So recommendation system Aditya is asking is part of supervised or unsupervised? Actually both. So in certain cases, you use recommendation to find clusters of people. So you try to find people who are similar to certain people. And if you want to find people who are similar to certain people, that's usually unsupervised learning. But if you want to recommend a specific product based on what others have purchased, that's supervised learning. So recommendation systems are actually a combination of supervised and unsupervised learning. So even faces with different facial expression, do we need on the supervised learning? Mayank is asking, yes, actually you need. So if you look at it, when you, if you purchase an iPhone and you're trying to register your fingerprint on it, or you're trying to register your face on it uh, for face ID, the iPhone will basically ask you to put your thumb onto the device multiple times at different angles, right? So it says, try this way, try the edges, try again, try there, try left, try right, right? So it's trying to do that. So what are you doing? Essentially, each and every try is creating an input data set for a supervised machine learning model, right? So it's also telling you to look at your face at different angles, look sideways, look front, look above, look bottom, right? It's essentially each time you look, each time it's, each time it's asking you to look and each time it is clicking your photo, it's basically supervised learning at play each and every is a different data point for supervised learning 
So what makes machine learning to give output in case of supervised learning, unsupervised learning, for instance, how many faces of a single person are detected? So Abhinash, you can actually allow it to count the number of times a single face came into the model. You can also make it identify all unique faces and give it to you. So all that is essentially possible, right? So does so does deepfake also use same approach? Actually, Saugat, yes, deepfake uh, does use similar approach. So deepfake, the creation of deepfake, and for those who don't know, uh, deepfake is wherein you're essentially replacing the face of an actual person. So there's an actual actor talking something is that face of that actor is replaced by another face. So I can replace the face of an actor by the face of uh, say. Uh, Joe Biden, okay, who is the current president of US, or I can replace it with the face of Narendra Modi, right? And I can make it appear as if Narendra Modi made a video, right? But it's not him who made the video. It is uh, somebody else who's acting. So you basically replace the face. The face replace, replacing the face is actually a boundary detection problem, similar to how we used in the Greek coins. So the, being able to identify the boundary of the face and replacing it is actually unsupervised machine learning at play. Okay. So Vrushali is asking, can we say that combination of supervised and unsupervised learning is required for good classification? Uh, Vrushali, yes and no. There are some problems. Actually, you would use different. So you use supervised when you have reference data, you use unsupervised when you don't have reference data and cannot have one, right? Unsupervised will require a lot of manual intervention. So most data scientists prefer supervised learning approaches. Supervised learning approaches are also easy to measure in terms of accuracy, performance, et cetera, is very, very easy to measure that. Doing the same with unsupervised is a lot of human labor. Uh, and there are subsequent sessions uh, that come in in you know thinking like a data scientist. So we have a specific sex, you know module called thinking like a data scientist that is given a specific problem. How do you take a decision of whether to use supervised or unsupervised or reinforcement or any other type of learning? And that session will be a really really good session for you to really understand in what combinations do you use. So most complex systems use combinations of supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement, and in supervised also there are like four or five different supervised learning models that actually get used in combination. So real world data science uses combination and all you have to do is intuition building. If you understand what combination on how to approach a specific problem, okay, if you understand that the ML bit is really, really easy. The real trick, the, the true value of a data scientist is being able to understand this on where to use supervised, where to use unsupervised, what data to use and how to classify this data, right? That's the real challenge. and it comes with practice, right? It won't come by theory. It won't come by looking at this one video. It'll come with practice. And we have a challenge towards the end of this course. And I think that'll actually allow you to practice for an entire week, uh, you know, on this very problem. So essentially, let's say I was to pass this photo into a clustering model on an unsupervised learning model, right? There's no training data provided. This is actually the photo of a yellow squash, right? But what the model would recognize out of this photo is it recognizes as a fruit that is elongated and it's yellow in color, right? So it would recognize it as yellow, elongated yellow fruit, but there is no way this unsupervised machine learning model can recognize this as yellow squash because there is no label. There's simply no way it can do it. Now, how does the model actually look at data? So this is, if you're, if you're to do clustering, which is cluster different types of items together. So let's say you gave this unsupervised learning model, a bunch of photos, a bunch, a bunch of photos of cupcakes, a bunch of photos of apples. This machine learning model would essentially cluster data together. So it would cluster similar looking photos together. So it can identify all apples and collect them in one basket. It can identify all cupcakes and collect them in another basket, but it won't know which is a cupcake and which is an apple. It doesn't know that it can't tell that. Right? So that you would have to humanly then inspect. So you would then have to humanly look at the two different clusters and say, okay, this is the photo of a cupcake and this is the photo of an apple, right? But you could use the same, you could use unsupervised machine learning to identify photos of cupcakes and apples, which is the model would not identify. It would not classify a cupcake and an apple. It would not classify. It would basically cluster, which means there is no training involved. You're just passing on photos, no training. You're just passing on photos and it is segregating all of these photos into different buckets. And when it is segregated into different buckets, 
in a natural form, all the cupcakes should be in one bucket and all the apples should be in another bucket, right? And if they are classified into two different buckets, you can visually inspect them and decide that, okay, yeah, this is all the cupcakes. Like, like if you have a bunch of photos, like you have millions of photos and you want to find out how many photos are cupcakes and how many photos are apples, you can use unsupervised learning. It'll classify them into buckets of cupcakes and apples. And then you can just count it and then say, okay, this is the count of cupcakes, this is the count of apples. However, the count may not be 100% accurate. You may be reasonably close, but not 100% certain. To be 100% certain that the count is correct, you would essentially have to go and look at each and every photo and see and confirm that indeed all the cupcakes, the ones in the cupcake basket are all cupcakes and the one in the apple basket are all apples, right? You would have to visually confirm this. Uh, there is no way to do it, right? So how do we test hypothesis? Exactly this, you have to actually go and manually look at the data to confirm your hypothesis, right? So. So Harsh is asking, I heard that data scientists actually update data model every month in a firm. What does that mean? Yes. So Harsh, all data models, all machine learning models actually get regular, regular updates, right? And they're updated because you get new data that is available. So uh, if you have additional data that comes in, uh, and especially this is company related data, right? So most of them who are working for companies are trying to do some degree of logistic optimization or build a recommendation engine or do inventory planning, sales forecasting, all of that. So when you, let's say you're doing sales forecasting, then in the month of April, right? I would do, I would use data all the way till the end of April. And I, I would basically take data on 30th of April and I would train a model to forecast sales for the month of May, right? But after the month of May has passed, I have real data for May, right? So I made a forecast for May, but my forecast could maybe only 90% accurate, maybe 92% accurate. So I might have an 8% error on the forecast. But when the actual data for the May month comes into the system, the data scientist now has to go back and retrain the model from scratch, okay, to include the May data in the training set so that the forecast for June can then be accurate. So all of the data scientists actually keep retraining all of these models as newer and newer data comes, becomes available. So when additional data comes in, they have to retrain the models to incorporate that additional data and incorporating that additional data makes the accuracy better. So if I take data only till April, my May forecast could be 92% accurate, but my June forecast, okay, if I just have April data, my June forecast will most certainly be lesser in accuracy. It could only be maybe 70% accurate. So as time goes by, the accuracy will drop. So as you go further in time in your forecast, the accuracy will actually substantially drop, right? So if I want it to be accurate, by the end of May month, I have to retrain my model with the data till end of May month so that my forecast for June can also be 92% accurate, right? So that's what it essentially means of wanting to retrain your models. So in clustering also, this is how, this is how machines look at data, right? And the green dots, the red dots, et cetera, are essentially just, you know, collection on a 2D space, which is an XY space, because it's all numeric end of the day, just collecting these dots together. Each dot actually refers to say one photo, right, or one occurrence of a face of a person. And then you have to look at that entire basket of those dots and find out what that face really belongs to. But you can see there are some dots that are actually in the boundary regions, which are in an approximate region. Those are the ones that are low in confidence. Actually, all the blue dots that you see are low in confidence. The center clusters are high confidence clusters. The blue ones are low confidence clusters. But there's some blue dots that actually come in intersecting boundaries, which are like indecisive. Right, so it's going to put it in one or the other basket, right? But you don't really know which one it is, so that requires human inspection. But if you want to generally approximately count how many of how many different types of you know dots were there, then you can actually use this to approximately count. It will not be an accurate count, but it can do it pretty pretty quickly for you. Right now, what we covered so far was supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Now let's go into reinforcement learning. Right. And reinforcement learning is very, very different than supervised and unsupervised, but many people use combinations of supervised and unsupervised along with reinforcement for getting desired output. So let's say we had a bot, right? And this bot, you can imagine this to be a rover sitting on Mars and the objective of the rover is to find that diamond. So it's the bot is there and it needs to find that diamond. And what it needs to go, it needs to find a path to find that diamond. 
The bot can only move up and down and horizontally. So only vertical and horizontal movements are allowed. Diagonal movements are not allowed, right? And the fire that you see in between are actually, uh, you know, bad areas. So those are like ditches and pits and everything. Wherein, if the bot goes into the bad area, it cannot come out. So it will damage itself. So you cannot go into the fire blocks. You can only go into other blocks. But the bot does not know for sure which one is fire and which one is not. It doesn't. So from the bot's perspective, it doesn't know the whole landscape. It needs to find the diamond, but it doesn't know how to navigate to the diamond. It's a bot. It doesn't really know, right? But it needs to figure this out. So how would it do it, right? It is essentially start with the bot finding the right path. And the right path is what you see in the red line. This is the appropriate path to use. This is the easiest path and the least effort path to reach the diamond. It will also save the bot a lot of battery power because battery is expensive. So the longer you travel, the more battery it takes. However, the bot is not aware of this path. It has to keep searching for the diamond. It doesn't really know where the diamond is and doesn't know that this path needs to be taken. Currently, it doesn't. Eventually, it might figure out, right? So the bot could potentially go this way. Right? It will go all the way up, then it will say, oops, there's no place to go, come down, then go to the diamond. It could also do it differently. It might take the perfect turn at the first cell, go all the way up and then go into the fire and then it's dead. So it would generally not enter the fire because it, you assume that this bot has some amount of sensors to sense danger. Right. So the sensor is essentially looking at danger, sensing the danger and then deciding whether to go into it or go, not go into it. Right. Now, it could also possibly take this route. Now, this route is a successful route. It will reach the diamond, but it's a longer route. It's a little low in efficiency, and it's better if the bot doesn't take this, right? But the bot wants to learn, right? It, there's no choice to learn. It, it can only see the cell in front of it. So it can only see one cell to the right, one cell to the left, one cell to the top, and one cell to the bottom. That's the sight of the camera. So imagine this is a really, really large landscape. It can only see one cell forward and sideways. Okay, one cell vertically and one cell horizontally, that's the line of sight. So it can only look at that much, only one cell at a time, that's the line of sight. So it has to go from one cell to the next to actually figure out what to do next, right? So the bot can essentially start moving at this point in time, right? It can go to cell number five and take a decision. At cell number five, it will figure out, I can have the choice of going back to cell nine, going to cell one or going to cell six, right? The right way to do is to go to cell six. At cell six, the choice is five or seven. Then I can go to cell seven. At seven, the choices go to three, 11 or six. Then I could go to 11. At 11, the choices go back to seven or go, go to 12. And if I find 12, success, right? Objective achieved. But it can only take this decision one cell at a time and it only can look at the cell surrounding it immediately. So there's no way for this bot to currently know where the diamond is. So it can keep roaming around all over the place. Now, let's say we took the bot actually took the path. It found the way, but it took the path. And this is the right way is nine to five, then six, then seven, then 11, then 12. So let's say the bot went from nine to five, five to six, six to seven, seven to 11, 11 to 12. If it did this, this is the most optimal route for the bot to take. And it has actually found out its actual you know, objective, which is the diamond. It found out. If it did this, that's super. In reality, it may not do this. In reality, it might go from nine to five, five to one, one to five, and then so on and so forth to the correct path. <coughs> now, at this point in time, I want to figure out if the bot took the right path or not, right? And I'm going to give the answer, and I want you to all type the answer anyways uh, in chat just to see, just to get your, uh, you know, let's see how many of you get it right, right? So. How would you, given these set of numbers, and to a machine learning model, it's only these numbers, okay? 9, 5, 1, 5, 6, 7, 11, 12, okay? These are the only numbers that you have. How would you figure out whether the path that is used is the shortest possible or not? Just by looking at the numbers, okay? You don't have the right, you don't have the reference of what is right. You just have what you did. This is what the bot did. And after the bot did this, it found 12, it found the diamond. So it's really happy it found the diamond. Now, the only data it remembers is the decisions it took. So it took the decision of going from nine to five, then it took the decision from five to one, then one to five, then five to six. It could have done this in any different combination, but this is the decision that it has currently taken. It has found the diamond after taking the decision. How will the bot know 
that whether it took the shortest possible path or it didn't take the shortest possible path. And if it didn't take the shortest possible path, then what is the shortest possible path, right? How will the dot figure this out, right? And you can all type the answers, but I'm going to go ahead and tell it anyways in the interest of time, right? The answer is very simple. What you're trying to look at is if any number reach, reaches, right? So I would not go with minimum is optimized or no. The only way to actually figure out is if a number is repeated. If the same cell position comes twice, anything between that number is actually redundant. So because the number five comes twice, so you can see there's a number five and there's a number five again, right? The number one in between is redundant. I cannot base this logic based on length because I do not know what is the shortest path. As a human being, you know what is the shortest path. The bot does not know what is the shortest path. So there is no reference from the vantage point of the bot, the path is unclear. The bot just took these random steps and found the diamond. Now it needs to figure out if the diamond is correct or not. Can I use a sorting algorithm? No, we cannot use a sorting algorithm. We cannot do a no number of moves algorithm because we don't know what is the right order to follow. So the only and only logic we can use is to see if a number repeated itself in the path that I took. So because the number five repeated twice in the path, every single action that I did between the two number, two occurrences of five is actually completely redundant. So I could have gone from five to one, one to five, five to nine, nine to five, and then five to six, everything that I did between the first five and the last five in the sequence is actually totally redundant, right? So I can actually skip the step one next time I want to find the diamond, right? And that's how the bot would learn from it. So essentially that five to five is indicating that you can actually jump right through, which means anything you did in between was totally irrelevant uh, to the context of the path that you were trying to take. So you could have just gone from one five to the next five, right? So you can look at repeat numbers and then learn from it, right? Now, when you're learning from it, there are two types of learnings that come into reinforcement learning, okay? There's a positive reinforcement and there's a negative reinforcement, which means I can reward the model for positive aspects and I can also reward the model for awarding negative conditions. So in both ways, you're rewarding the model. There's no penalization that's happening. In one case, I reward the model for doing the right thing and continuing to do the right thing. In the other aspect, negative reinforcement, I'm actually rewarding the model for avoiding a negative condition, okay? So a negative reinforcement would happen if the bot avoids the fire, for example, that's a, that's a negative reinforcement, which is I'm saying, okay, you did the right thing, you avoided the fire, so I'm gonna give you brownie points for that. And if it continues moving onto the correct path, if it takes the shortest path, I would actually give brownie points for doing the right path, which is a positive reinforcement. So let's see how, how these would work, right? So positive reinforcement is essentially, is defined when an event occurs, okay, due to a particular behavior, then that, it happens due to a particular behavior, then this reinforcement increases the strength and the frequency of the behavior. In other words, it has a positive impact on the behavior, okay? How would you look at this in this current context? So in this context, your cell nine was your starting point, your cell 12 was your ending point. Everything you did in between is a question. So when the bot goes to step five, the bot is on step five, on step six, seven, and 11, I will reward the bot for taking these steps. These steps is where I would reward the bot for. I would not disincentivize the bot for the step one that was taken, okay? Uh, I would not disincentivize it. I would just reward it, which is a positive reward that is given for taking the correct steps. So only the highlighted blocks, I would give a positive reward for that. Now, a positive reinforcement essentially has an advantage of maximizing a certain performance, which is sustained change for a long period of time, which, mean, which means basically, if I want to maximize the positive behavior, the bot is doing the right thing. I want to maximize it doing the right thing. I will use a positive reinforcement. I want to sustain that right behavior for a long period of time. I would use positive reinforcement. The disadvantage is the bot might actually get too comfortable by doing the right thing too many times. So it would simply get too comfortable and then it will start misbehaving, okay? It's, it's basically very much like a child. So it's like every time a child does the right thing or does studying, you give it chocolates. Every time it does studying, you give it additional chocolates. It continues to study, you give it extra chocolates, right? Studying for two hours, you give extra chocolates. 
now the child the naturally the child what the try what the child tries to do is tries to not study and see if he or she still gets the chocolates right because you got them used to the chocolates so much used to the chocolates that you overload it it's called an overload of states right that the child is naturally going to start figuring out wait a second what if i don't study i just give you an impression of studying will i still get chocolates maybe yes because maybe your mom didn't find out that you didn't actually study you're creating an impression of studying and you still got the chocolates right the neural network works very similar to how humans work it works very similar to how children work so the very fact that you can actually keep giving the positive reinforcement allows the person to misbehave right it's also like telling an employee in a company that you're doing great every time they do even somewhat great you tell them oh you're doing great you're doing great you're doing great if you keep telling them you're doing great the performance actually starts dropping over time because they're like oh you know what i think i'm going to get the credit even if i don't do this thing right so the problem of too much reinforcement uh kicks in when you're doing positive reinforcement right so jyoti says i think the target path should be the shortest uh jyoti the to get the shortest path the really question is from the bot's perspective on how do we find out what is the shortest path so to find out the shortest path you have to identify repeat numbers repeat positions and then remove everything that happened between the repeat okay so how different is the bot problem from dynamic programming uh we can solve this by tweaking the shortest path i'll go how exactly this reinforcement learning is useful in real world so lakshman this reinforcement learning is actually very very actively used it is it is dynamic programming reinforcement learning is very very actively used in actual navigation of bots so say you say, send a rover on mars that rover wants to navigate the landscape of mars you would use reinforcement learning for navigating the surface of mars uh you would also use reinforcement learning to train uh, a computer to play games so playing specifically games like tetris etc or ping pong uh, actually works on reinforcement learning right so if you get too optimized then check time and space complexity yes i that is correct reinforcement learning is a bit confusing abhishek says yes that's totally fine it can it is always a bit confusing when you start with it because it's the first time you're doing it it'll be a little confusing uh, as you keep practicing it as you keep learning more and more of it it actually becomes really really easy right so but i hope you understood this concept of uh, the problem of the child when if you give positive reinforcement your positive confirmation you say good job good job good job good job mediocre the person does a mediocre job also you say good job good job good job good job the person starts actually performing bad you give the child chocolates for every time they study and even if they even somewhat study you give them chocolates you keep giving them chocolates the child starts to wonder if i don't study where i still get chocolates right and and that's the problem of too much uh too much reinforcement on the other side negative reinforcement works exactly the opposite of positive reinforcement right so negative reinforcement basically is defined as the strengthening of a behavior because a negative condition is stopped or avoided okay keep this in mind negative reinforcement is not penalizing for taking a wrong action but it's actually incentivizing for avoiding a wrong action okay okay can we abhishek is asking can we use the process flow reinforcement learning abhishek we cannot use a process flow uh, it doesn't actually use the same process flow that you saw in supervised and unsupervised uh reinforcement is a little more complicated than that it works it works differently so you have to really understand it at a conceptual level uh, uh at a computer level it won't be clear i'm not even trying to explain how it works at a computer level i'm just trying to explain how it works at a conceptual level the later modules that we do in the course you will have a detailed understanding of how it actually happens at the computer level okay but it's not actually a process that you follow in supervised and unsupervised reinforcement is a little different right so a negative reinforcement is actually also when you define a strengthening of a behavior because a negative condition is stopped or avoided now keep in mind abhishek that when you're doing reinforcement learning it is actually somewhat supervised learning because you already know what is the right and what is the wrong okay so you already know the right and the wrong which is kind of having labeled data on this is right and this is wrong so you're doing it as if it's supervised learning but the problem space is very complex which is your future action needs to depend on context of previous action so your bot's next decision is based on context of all previous actions in case of machine learning models it doesn't work that way if you pass it the photo of a cupcake it will say it is a cupcake next you pass the photo of an apple it will say it is an apple right but uh it cannot actually uh figure out 
right? Uh, that it's the, the very fact that you pass the photo of a cupcake first and then the photo of an apple has no influence. Each data point, each use is independent and reinforcement, you're actually training it across multiple uses. So yes, let's get to the example of reinforcement learning, right? So in this case, in the same case, the same path, to use negative reinforcement, if the bot avoided going to cell number one, avoided going to cell number one, I would give it brownie points for avoiding it. If it avoided, if it didn't avoid, I would not do anything. If it, if it went from five to one, I would not give it negative reinforcement. I would not give it positive reinforcement either because positive reinforcement would be given at cell five. Positive reinforcement most certainly would not be given at cell one. So it would miss out a positive reinforcement. So this time, the bot doesn't get chocolates. It doesn't know why it didn't get chocolates. Okay, okay, I didn't get chocolates. Okay, fine. But if the bot went from five to six directly, then I would give it chocolates. But I would give it chocolates for avoiding one and I would give it extra chocolates for taking the right decision. So which means I would give it a positive enforcement and a negative reinforcement saying, oh, you actually avoided a potential negative condition, right? So yeah. Ramana is asking by calculating the distance between the points, you cannot actually calculate Ramana the distance between the points is, is really because uh, you do not know from the vantage point of the bot on what all points you went to, right? You do not know the layout of the surface. You do not know what the actual distance is. You do not know that 12 is beside nine in the same row. The bot does not know this. The bot can only look at the next cell at a time. You as a human being are looking at this from the top so you can actually figure out what's the shortest path. But from where the bot is, the bot can only see one cell ahead at a time. So it really doesn't know how where position 12 is in relation to position nine, right? It doesn't know that. So distance calculation is not possible, right? So you have to simply rely on numbers that we have, right? So a negative reinforcement is if the bot does not go to step one, does not. If it goes to step one, there's no brownie points. If the bot does not go to step one and goes directly from five to six, right? Right, it would basically avoid. So yes, it is, uh, it is avoiding when a wrong decision is avoided, okay? You avoid it when the bot avoids a wrong decision, right? That is negative reinforcement. Now, essentially negative reinforcement has a specific advantage. It actually increases certain type of behavior. It actually increases, increases avoiding the wrong. And it basically provide defiance to minimum standard of performance. So basically it can actually make sure that your system, you know, conforms to a minimum standard of performance. So it basically, you have a minimum standard of performance and you can actually make it force that minimum standard of performance. And we'll take some examples of this, which will really make it clear, real life examples. It'll make it clear, right? So the disadvantage of negative reinforcement is it can only provide enough to meet up to the minimum behavior. Okay, it cannot provide you better quality of service. It cannot provide you an optimized route, but it can only provide you conformance to a minimum standard of behavior, which is saying avoid the negative aspect, which is conformance to minimum standard. Okay, and a lot of this will be clear in the next few slides, right? So let's look at uses of reinforcement learning. And this will actually give you, we'll take examples of what positive reinforcement and what negative reinforcement means, you know, in these contexts, okay? So an actual real world use of a positive and a negative reinforcement or reinforcement learning is this Amazon workshop. Okay, this is actually an Amazon workshop. You have, you can actually see the Amazon logo also there, right? And you have these bots which can carry weights, right? And these weights go all over the place. These bots have to, this, the, the, the workshop is actually the, like the storage area, the warehouse, sorry, it's not a workshop. The warehouse is very, very, very large, right? There's, and there are different people walking in it there are different types of obstacles that are thrown in between. So there are different types of boxes and items thrown in between. There are different types of bots that are simply standing in between. Okay. So a lot of those things, uh, you know, happen in, in between. And considering that, that they're happening in between, there is no right path that can be pre-programmed because you might just have a human being taking a chair and sitting in the middle of a bot pathway, right? And the bot has to go around this human being. So the layout of the land is actually uncertain. It cannot be pre-programmed. Although it's a fixed layout workshop, the layout of the land is really uncertain because you don't know where a large cargo shipment has arrived. It was just dropped on the floor at one place. So the bot can't really cross that point. So it is so uncertain that the bot now has to use reinforcement learning to figure out what is the most optimal route to take because the 
most optimal route changes every few minutes every time a box moves around the most optimal route changes every time there's a whole you know line of bots that are clogged up at one region the other bot has to use an alternate route to go around them right so even the bots themselves are obstructions this bot can't jump over another bot so the other bot has to move out of the way but for the other bot to move out of the way there has to be place to move out of the way there's some bots that are completely stuck between other bots and they can't really move out of the way right so in such a situation reinforcement learning is your only solution you cannot use unsupervised you cannot use supervised because unsupervised and supervised are both dependent on given input given output one input output it is forgotten after that next input output it is forgotten after that right it cannot remember previous states reinforcement learning can remember all your previous states so it needs to have a recall of what position was okay what position was not okay where the obstacle was in the last run and then keep finding it out and maybe once a while go back and check if the obstacle that was previously standing there is still standing there and if the obstacle now is not standing there then it can use that as a valid path right so it has to keep rediscovering its path on every single run every single time it carries a parcel it has to keep rediscovering its path so this is an actual example of reinforcement learning at play right and this cannot be done with either supervised or unsupervised it's not possible right and you cannot even have labeled data because the dynamics change really really rapidly right so let's look at three other scenarios where reinforcement learning will help right and those this this amazon is really obvious there are some other non obvious scenarios and let's look at those right uh one there's a lack of analytical solution which means like in the warehouse case you cannot have an analytical solution to the problem because the whole landscape is so diverse that you cannot very precisely say what's the right approach to do something right and at least from the context of the bot it's not possible the given data that you have at that moment does not allow you to come up with an accurate analytical solution both unsupervised and supervised rely on producing an accurate analytical solution based on given input when an analytical solution is not possible your only other option is reinforcement learning and what that really means is let's say you are teaching a car you basically a car is driving itself right now you already have pre-programmed models for the car to drive the car already has supervised learning models which have learned what a person looks like what a dog looks like what a deer looks like what a kangaroo looks like so if a kangaroo jumps on the street the car can identify the kangaroo and it can try to avoid the kangaroo but as far as the car is concerned the kangaroo is an obstacle a person is an obstacle a child on a bicycle in the middle of the road is an obstacle and an obstacle must be avoided right however the car that that alone just avoiding obstacles is not enough to drive a vehicle it has to also understand traffic lights but even if it understands traffic lights it understand road boundaries that is not enough you will land up in situations where the boundary of the road at times is uncertain right the lane is uncertain the way other cars are driving around you is uncertain somebody in front of you suddenly breaks your car has to break this is a self driving vehicle right somebody a truck tries to push you to the left or the right you have to actually push to the left or the right or you're going to crash in them so your safety is not a function of just the data around you or fixed items around you it's about also related to actions that other human drivers take right and the common problem that tesla faces is when a tesla is driving in autopilot mode there are other drivers around a tesla that actually drive very very rash okay so drivers around the tesla actually don't respect the car they try to do any types of you know stupid maneuvers they will just change the lane they will brake they will accelerate they'll do random things when they see a tesla because they know the tesla is actually self driving itself so there is no way the tesla is going to crash into them no matter what they do okay so tesla is not subject to human error so if you have a tesla next to you you can actually bully the car the car won't bully you back you can't bully a human driver next to you the driver will bully you back right a tesla won't bully you back right so a tesla driver led car you can actually misbehave with a tesla driver led car because it won't bully you back and this actually it is actually observed where people drive very very rash next to a car driving in an autopilot mode because they are very confident that the ai in the car will not crash in them but the dynamics are very very different so what does that mean right now how does it apply to positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement okay so if the car is driving on the center of the road right and continues driving on the center of the lane right and it is driving smoothly it's giving a smooth ride to the passengers you would give it a positive reinforcement each and every second you'll say oh okay 
last second you did the right thing okay the previous second you did the right thing okay the previous second you did the right thing you're continuing to do the right thing and i'm giving it a positive reinforcement now if there is a child that comes in front of the vehicle and the vehicle breaks right which is it avoids a negative condition which is avoids colliding on a child and it breaks right i would now give it a negative reinforcement okay congratulations you actually avoided a negative condition negatively reinforced okay don't do that if a child comes again you break this time that was the right thing to do don't ever not break when you see a child okay keep breaking every time you see a child so i'm going to give you brownie points because you did the right thing and you braked when you saw a child in front of you okay similarly if the car is drifting towards the edge of a lane and the car corrects itself and brings itself back to center i would again give it a negative reinforcement for not jumping the lane but every time the car jumps the lane okay the car would neither receive a positive reinforcement neither a negative reinforcement okay neither positive neg neither negative when the car does not receive a positive reinforcement and it does not receive a negative reinforcement the car can now know that oops i actually did something wrong i did something wrong because in the last one second i did not get brownie points i did not get a positive brownie point and i did not get a negative brownie point okay i, I was neither positively reinforced nor negatively reinforced and the very fact that i was neither positively or negatively reinforced i definitely did something wrong which is i crossed the line okay so every time a neither a positive reinforcement is achieved or a negative reinforcement achieved it basically means you you violated a condition okay now let's look at this from the standpoint of i'm going to throw an example i don't have this on the slide but an example is autopilot in aircrafts okay your aircrafts are usually put on autopilot mode right now in case of an autopilot mode this is really really easy to understand now right in case of an autopilot mode there are two types of things that can happen right the first thing is keeping the plane safe right and the second thing is giving the passengers a comfortable ride right so even if i have to take a left turn i want to take a right turn i want to increase altitude i will gradually increase altitude i'll gradually take a left turn so that the hot coffee that you're drinking doesn't actually spill on you right so the autopilot is going to do smooth maneuvers every time the autopilot does a smooth maneuver the autopilot gets a reinforcement which is a positive reinforcement saying you did the right thing by keeping the plane smooth right however if there's a mountain in front or there are birds in front of the plane the plane has to do or there's another plane in front of the plane the plane must do an emergency maneuver okay because to avoid a negative condition it's negative reinforcement it has to do an emergency maneuver so in case of the ai model which works a little differently right a negative reinforcement trigger which is a trigger by ai saying that a negative condition is about to occur which is you are about to violate a negative reinforcement condition must always supersede violating a positive reinforcement condition which means if you see a plane in front of another plane the plane is an autopilot and another you know a simple cessna or something comes in which is a manual plane it doesn't really even have a radar it's a small aircraft which really comes in front of this commercial jetliner which is an autopilot this aircraft would have to have to suddenly maneuver itself which would change direction increase altitude drop altitude it would have to take a sudden move when it is taking the sudden move it is obviously violating your positive reinforcement which is the coffee that you're drinking is going to spill on you now that is unavoidable so either you can avoid spilling the coffee or you can avoid colliding the negative reinforcement says avoid colliding the positive reinforcement says give passengers a comfortable ride so when a negative reinforcement and a positive reinforcement come up with counter actions which are two different actions one says drive smooth the other says you know take a emergency maneuver okay the negative reinforcement which says take an emergency maneuver must always supersede positive reinforcement which means the negative reinforcement will will ensure conformity to a minimum standard of safety right so the negative reinforcement guarantees your safety which is it will avoid a collision at any cost it doesn't matter how bad the ride is for you it will avoid the collision at any cost right and that is negative reinforcement right so it doesn't care what happens to the passengers inside it will not collide because if it collides anyways you're dead right so even if you're injured you get thrown out of your seat that's actually still a better outcome than colliding so a negative reinforcement will always supersede a positive reinforcement right so 
keep this fundamental basic principle in mind. Same, a Tesla can do an emergency brake, which would make you slam your head on the steering wheel, but it'll still do the emergency brake because that's a negative reinforcement and the negative reinforcement will always supersede a positive reinforcement when positive reinforcement is trying to give you a smooth ride, right? So positive reinforcement gives you smoothness of behavior, okay, which is a certain quality aspect or a certain luxurious aspect to your ride, okay, is given by positive reinforcement, but a negative reinforcement will always hit, always basically comply with minimum conformity of safety, right? Yes, so Yogesh is asking, does the sounds more like dopamine hit pleasure? By any chance, the model developed the dopamine starvation-like condition? Yes, actually it does, Yogesh. So that's the thing. So that's what I'd said before. So <clears throat> if you go back to the previous slides, right? If you look at positive reinforcement, there's a problem with the positive reinforcement, which is problem of overload of states. You keep giving it you know, a pleasure every single time it is continuing to fly the plane the right way, you keep giving it pleasure, it actually learns too much from it, right? But the next time you don't give it pleasure, it kind of figures out, oh, okay, there's something wrong, right? So I need to do something to keep getting pleasure, right? So there is a dopamine starvation that happens every time the plane takes a slight sharp left turn, slight sharp right turn, it'll try to then correct itself and come back to a better quality of ride, right? But if a negative reinforcement is triggered, then the negative reinforcement must always supersede a positive reinforcement because the negative reinforcement, basically it, it, it gives you conformance to a minimum standard of performance, okay? Which could be, which could essentially be important to your safety. But a negative reinforcement will only provide enough to meet the minimum behavior. So if the plane is not going to collide and you just use negative reinforcement, your ride would most certainly be really, really bad, right? So the plane can do, you know, aggressive maneuvers for a left turn, right turn, as if you're sitting in a fighter plane, but there's no negative reinforcement trigger because the plane is not going to crash on anything. It's not expected to crash on anything, but it would most certainly not give you the right ride. Okay. So this we have done, lack of analytical solution. So over here, there's no lack of, there's no analytical solution possible, right? You really have to work on dynamic environments, right? So, but Tesla needs human input every five seconds while autopilot, uh, they want, I'm not sure that is right, right? Uh, it's basically just checking if you're sitting on the seat and whether you're attentive, it's not actually, you're not having to drive the car, right? It's just checking if you're attentive. Next, let's look at simulations, right? So let's say this is an actually a biological problem wherein I have these protein, protein structures and I have to fold and unfold these protein structures. These are really convoluted protein structures. And you start with the folded structure and I want to unfold the structure. What I do is my previous state actually influences my next state and then my next state influences the state after that and the state after that influences the state after that. So in, in, in pharmaceutical problems where you want to actually do protein folding and unfolding, reinforcement learning is very, very actively used, right? An example of this is you have your headphones, which are your wired headphones, and you have the cables that get tangled, right? And then you have to untangle them one at a time. And sometimes you untangle wrong, and then you come back to the, you, you reverse what you did, and then you keep trying and trying and trying it until you've untangled it. This is exactly the same thing. Untangling in a headphone is actually a reinforcement learning problem. Supervised learning or unsupervised learning cannot achieve untangling of uh, headphones. Similarly, folding and unfolding of proteins, which is essentially untangling and tangling of proteins, cannot be done without reinforcement learning. So this is a very, very common use case of reinforcement learning in the biotech industry. So if you are a data scientist and you join biotech, you will most certainly use reinforcement learning in these scenarios. Right? The next is operating under unknown environments. Right? And this is similar to a bot problem wherein there's a bot and it doesn't know what the surrounding environment is. It's completely unknown, but it can interact with its immediate next surrounding. It can see a few feet ahead and it can interact. It has a sensor that can sense if there's a stone in front of it, et cetera. That's all it can do. And it can keep looking at the surroundings with a limit of vision, right? It can't see all the way in the, in the, in the end, right? It can't even process that the quality of that image drops. It can see few feet in front of it. And then it has to keep taking decisions on what's the right place to move, wrong place to move, where should I be, where am I safe, where am I not safe, etc. It's basically finding that out very, very actively. And that itself is uh, reinforcement learning. The very fact that you're doing that is essentially reinforcement learning. 
So next thing, just curious, right? What do you think babies have been doing all this while? You give the baby a lemon, the baby will really react to the lemon and that reaction to the lemon is actually reinforcement learning. And that's a negative reinforcement that you're giving to the baby saying, okay, do not lick lemons. It's really, really bad, right? So all human beings, okay, actually use reinforcement learning to, to learn. So the very, the very development of a human being from the time they're a child to the time they become an adult, uh, which is the neural pathways in your brain actually use uh, reinforcement learning. Conceptually, they're the same thing. What humans have gone and done is we have replicated the functioning of the human mind into a computer system. Okay, that's all we have basically done. We have replicated the functioning of the human mind in a computer system. And that's how we have made the computer system intelligent. But the very fact of positive and negative reinforcement learning comes from human beings themselves. It doesn't come from elsewhere, right? So supervised versus reinforcement, this is a common you know, confusion, right? So let's look at the quick difference between them. So in supervised learning, the decisions are made on the initial input, okay? So you've given an initial input, which is a training data set, then only that input was, was used for training. Now, every decision that you take after that is based on that initial input, right? And whereas in reinforcement learning, the decisions are made sequentially, which means the current input also influences your next output. Okay, so which means my current state on what I have at post, okay, influences my next output. Ashish is asking solving Rubik's cube is a relation, uh, you know, reinforcement learning problem. Answer is yes. Okay, uh, Ashish, it is yes. Aparna, yes. Reinforcement learning is what babies do. That is correct. Okay, so decisions are made sequentially, which means the previous state of the Rubik's cube will, you know, uh, influence the next state of the Rubik's cube, for example. So reinforcement learning is actually based sequentially one after the other right? The current input, the current output influences the next input, the next output influences the input after that, right? But in supervised learning, it's just transactional one at a time. In supervised learning, there's no, it's the same thing, there's no sequential decision making. Whereas in reinforcement learning, it's a sequential decision making, which is the output depends on the state of the current input, and the next input depends on the output of the previous state, okay? So it's one after the other, right? Now, another, another difference between supervised and reinforced is supervised is independent decisions, which are completely independent and reinforcement dependent action to action. So one action influences the next. And in reinforcement, you can have positive plus negative action combinations that influence your next actions, okay? So this is an important thing to understand why supervised or unsupervised cannot actually be used in place of reinforcement because supervised and unsupervised are very, very transactional nature. One input, one output at a time. Next input, one output at a time. Reinforcement is actually a sequence. It actually remain, re remembers the previous pathway. It remembers the previous tangle to detect how to untangle. It remembers your current driving position, your current velocity, your current speed, and what you cannot do and cannot do, uh, you know, can do and cannot do, etc. So reinforcement is very, very commonly used in those types of complex business scenarios. So Yogesh asks, how does a train model behave in unknown situations? So Yogesh. The, the trick is that in unknown situation, you would actually have a negative trigger, right? A negative trigger can essentially, in case of a Tesla, a negative trigger will basically default in an action of braking. Okay, so you essentially break the car. So you get neither a positive reinforcement nor a negative reinforcement. When you are about to do a negative action, you will neither get a positive or a negative reinforcement. In case of no reinforcement in the last one second, the default action of a Tesla would be to brake. Okay. The default action of an airplane in autopilot mode, when it no longer gets a positive or a negative reinforcement, which means it is entering bad weather or a stormy clouds and the autopilot cannot actually sustain itself because it's missing a negative. It's missing a positive reinforcement because the ride is just too rough. Okay. So it's so rough that the positive reinforcement is missed but there is no negative action. It's not going to collide with anything. So there's no negative, which is, it's not avoiding collision. So there's no negative also. So positive is missed and a negative missed. When a positive and negative is missed, the default action of an airplane is to actually beep and disengage autopilot. So it'll beep and it'll say autopilot disengage. Then the pilot has to manually take over, right? So that is what you would do. So there are certain default actions that you have to pre-program and set in the system, you know, to decide whether it is, uh, you know, whether the reinforcement learning can keep continuing to operate this machinery or it needs to stop. In the rover on Mars, if there is no positive or negative reinforcement, the rover will simply stop. Because the assumption is where you are right now, you are safe, right? And Mars doesn't have storms, it doesn't have an atmosphere, 
so it doesn't have storms, right? So where you are right now, you're naturally safe. So the default action of the robot would be just to hang in case of no positive or no re or negative reinforcement, just hang there and just sit there and it'll wait for command from earth on what to do next, right? So that's all I have in the session, but before we go for today, right? And I hope you've enjoyed it and I can see that some of the feedback is good. Thank you so much, Rushali. great session. I, I love taking it too. So before we go, we have to announce this one contest for you, which is the seven days of data science challenge. And as we said, last week we did the lucky draw for the, uh, for the Echo Dots, right? This week, and this is a seven day thing, this week it is not a lucky draw. This week it is completely skill-based, okay? So this week we are gonna actually do seven days of data science. And this seven days of data science is gonna be skill-based. And the three winners, three top winners of this seven days of data science challenge will get a free pass to our entire training course, which is currently you have access to the first 14 sessions. You can extend access to all the 40 sessions. So you'll get a free pass to the entire course. The so top three candidates, rank one, rank two, and rank three, get a free pass to our entire training program, which is worth 74,999 rupees. So you're getting 74,999 rupees worth of value, completely free by being a winner of seven days of data science challenge. Even though you win or you don't win, there is a lot to learn from the challenge. So this challenge is specifically designed to start building your uh, data science thinking skill set. So it's basically start to think like a data scientist. So what is the challenge? Challenge is very simple, which is submit seven real world business use cases for AI. Okay. You don't accurately have to know the solution. You have to know the problem. So you need to know where AI can be used. So you have to submit seven real world business uses of AI. In that, talk about how you would use AI and ML. So talk about how you would use AI and ML. If you get it accurate, superb. You don't have to get it accurate. What you really need to know is the business use case has to be really good. And I'll give you examples. You can say AI can be used in fraud detection in financial industry. Okay, is one. These are very, really simple. If you do this, something simple as this, you won't get brownie points for it. Right, so you do complex, right? Or, or AI can be used to build a recommendation engine for e-commerce. This is a use case for AI, right? Now talk about how would you use the AI? How I would use the AI is I would use supervised learning in case of recommendation engine. I would look at what products others have bought. I would pass it through a supervised learning model. Then I would take this current customer and figure out which product should I recommend to the customer, okay? What model would you use? I would use a supervised learning model. And model basically means supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement learning. What would you use? Or would you use combinations thereof? Would I use a combination of supervised plus reinforcement? Like in the example of an auto-driving car, you have supervised learning to train it to recognize, you know, different, uh, different human beings, et cetera, human beings, trees, pathways. Recognizing that is supervised learning but actually driving is reinforcement learning. So you can use combinations of models. So you can say what model would you use? You can say combinations and what combinations? What data would you use to train your machine learning model, right? And where would this data come from? Like how easy it is to get this data? So you have to submit this and you have to submit seven such real world business use cases. So I know all of you, most of you are working professionals. So look at your own companies, look at what data your company has, Look at what business problems your company has. Don't look at what data science problem your company has. Look at what business problem your company has. The business problem could be logistic optimization, proper product pricing, product positioning, inventory planning, sales forecasting, right? Or you could even be working in, uh, you know, general government services, which is your, uh, you know, drinking water supply. So you want to predict what the drinking water level in your reservoirs would be, etc. So these are various types of problems, right? I've thrown some examples. Please don't submit the same examples back. You can, but you don't get brownie points for submitting the same back. You get brownie points for coming up with really, really unique use cases where AI could be used. And the idea is to get you to think on how data that any company has can be used with combination of AI to actually solve a business problem, okay? The rules are you have to submit a minimum of seven entries by 11.59 p.m. on 15th May, 2021, which is next Saturday. By midnight next Saturday, you have to submit seven entries. My recommendation is submit one entry per day. Okay, that's my recommendation. You don't have to. You can submit all seven together. You can also submit all seven today, or you can open submit all seven, you know, next Saturday, et cetera. And if you submit more than seven, we will consider the best seven that you have. Okay, so you can submit more than seven if you want. We'll consider the best seven. The top three ranked candidates win 
three when three passes to our entire course completely free of cost so 74999 worth of course you get it completely free of cost now out of all honesty we know we have students who are already part of the course so some of you are actually members of this program actually quite a few are already enrolled members and if an enrolled member wins then we refund you the 100% money back so even an enrolled member can win so whatever money you've already paid for the course you will actually get the entire course fee back so even you are eligible and you can even you can participate and the submission form will capture your email address so make sure you enter the same email address every single time in each and every submission you have to enter the email address so make sure you enter the same email address. it's a simple type form and you will receive an email shortly with all of these uh, details right so they have to be seven different use cases uh, varun okay and i'll tell you how the grading works right so each submission basically has six items. So there's six fields, which are text fields that you have to type when you're submitting and just type one, one, two, two lines. We don't want long explanations. Okay. Short explanations, problem definition, short explanation it can be fraud detection for financial industry. Industry will be banking slash finance. Proposed solution is take data of all transactions, use an unsupervised learning model to find if there is an anomaly in the data. This is a proposed solution. What AI and approach will you use? I would use an unsupervised learning model. What data will be used? Data is used of the actual transactions that have happened in the bank. Where does the data come from? The bank obviously has this in its database. Okay. Simple as that. This is a simple explanation. This is what you would submit. So you submit these six items and you submit this seven times. Okay. Seven different problem definitions. Okay. The scoring criteria is based on five factors. Okay. It's uniqueness of idea, which is how unique your idea is, gets you brownie points the practicality of implementation, which is you might come with the most wackiest of ideas, but how practical is it to implement this idea in real life also gets you brownie points. Then you are proposing a solution on how you would use AI and ML. What is the accuracy of your proposed solution? Like <clears throat> we have a panel of jury, which are our trainers. Our trainers will all look at your submissions and anonymously grade them on these aspects. Okay. So the trainer is then looking at the submission and basically looking at what is the accuracy of the uh, solution that is there. Then the depth of problem understanding. Okay. We're not going to look at the accuracy of solution is there, but what is the depth of your problem understanding? Like how deeply do you really understand the problem? Okay. Like what is the problem? What data is required to actually address this problem, etc. We're looking at, so how deeply do you understand the problem? Because the first step to solving a problem is really understanding a problem. So if you really understand a problem with absolute level of certainty, you can solve it. And then we look at availability of data or feasibility of data capture, which is, is that data available to actually solve the problem? Or do you have a way in which you can capture this data? Is it feasible to capture? Okay. Now there are five points for each. Okay. For each of these, uh, you know, five items, there's five points each making a maximum score of 25 points per submission. So for every submission, you can get a maximum score of 25 points. And across a total of seven, seven submissions, you obviously get a maximum score of 175 points. So the maximum that anyone can score is 175 points. We will score you every single day and we will give you a leaderboard uh, every single day that will come to you. Okay. So each and every day. So where to submit? Okay. That's actually a good question. So you will all receive an email. If you've not already received, you will receive an email with a link to a form that allows you to submit, uh, you know, the previous six information. So it allows you to submit this along with your name and email address. Please type the same email every single time so that we know it's from the same person. Okay. And you are then scored every single day. We will score you on uniqueness of idea each and every day. Our trainers will score. So we are actually committing a lot of time to this. And this exercise is not, we are, we are adding a free ticket and a contest aspect to just make it a little more interesting. Right. And the three highest scoring entries win the tickets. Okay. Highest scoring, but the true you know, reason for doing this is to actually build your intuition on how data science can be used in various industry, industry problems. So whether you win or not, this exercise is something that's going to really, really take you a long way in your data science career. Okay. So it's like absolutely like a must do for all of you. If you're looking at becoming a data scientist someday, this is the starting point. This is what will start getting you to think like a data scientist. It's okay. If you can't get the solution. The very fact that you can't get the solution today is your start. The first step, the first time you start with something, you won't know how to solve the problem. But the very fact that you can now see the problem and you can see that there is a problem 
itself is a big achievement, right? All solutions, like all inventions, invention of a flying plane came in because somebody saw that there is a problem that humans can't fly. They didn't know how to make a human fly, but they saw that humans can't fly. And then they started thinking about how to solve it. And then they were able to solve it. So the first step towards achieving anything is to knowing that something needs to be achieved. Okay. Please explain point five again, where you get the data. Okay. So point five is, is the data available? Like let's say if you say fraud detection in banks, okay, then data is available. You can say the data is available in the database of the bank. Okay. The bank obviously has this data, so we can do it. But let's say I want to figure out what is the correlation of temperature against altitude, like predict what is the temperature, you know, above the surface of earth, you know, at a specific point. And why do I want to predict this temperature? Because I want to launch rockets. So if I want to launch a rocket, the rocket cannot be launched if temperature at 100,000 feet is below a certain freezing point. Okay, it cannot be launched because it would damage some of the machinery of the rocket. So I can only launch the rocket if the weather above is of a certain you know, specific limit within a certain range. So I want to train a model to figure out what the temperature at 100,000 feet above the surface of Earth would be. Now, to ascertain what the temperature would be, where would I get the data from? Is the data available? Do we have weather data? Like what data would I use? It starts with what data would I use? And what data would you use is basically attributed to point number fourth, which is depth of understanding of your problem, okay? How deeply do you understand the problem? Like, is it really solvable? And how would you approach it, right? and the availability of data like is that data available and if not available do you have a means to capture it so you can say that this is how you would capture this data and we can use this technology to capture it and it's maybe not that expensive to capture the data and we can get it so look at it from your business okay don't come up with absolute general problem statement look at the company you are working in look at the industry you're working in. look at your very organization okay i can assure you there are hundreds of things that a company does today that can be done with data science Okay, AI and ML can help you automate a lot of things that you humanly do in your enterprise. Okay, so your job is to find out what that is in your enterprise. Okay, look at it. The uniqueness of ideas is important. Like how unique is the problem? So don't come with something that you can Google and say, okay, fraud detection, this, that, everything. That is all standard problem statements. There are examples for it, right? So is it possible to send all seven together? Yes, you can send all seven together. You can send more than seven if you want. We will evaluate your best seven. So if you want to send 10 entries, we'll pick out the best seven scores that you got and that will be your effective score. Okay, every single day, each and every day, we will publish the leaderboard. So each and every day, you will know the ranking of all of you that submit. Okay, it's an entire exhaustive leaderboard. End of every day, the first one we will get published tomorrow. You all will receive an email with the link to the form today. You can go on that form today and you can make your first submission today. You can make more than one submission if you want today. Okay. And then based on the submission that you have so far, we will compute your scores. Okay. And we will show you a leaderboard tomorrow. You will receive a leaderboard with names and the score mentioned name and score of each and every one of you. So you will see the top three ranks tomorrow. Those three ranks are on their path towards getting those free tickets. Those are the winners, okay? You can look at the leaderboard every single day. We will update it every single day. You keep submitting your entries every single day. I recommend you submit it every single day, but if you want to submit all seven together, that's also fine. We will consider one best entry for score of tomorrow. We will consider two best of your entries for score on Tuesday, three best of one entries for score on Wednesday. And this goes all the way on Saturday. You can submit till Saturday midnight. Right, Sunday in the Sunday session next weekend, we will give you the final leaderboard. So you're seeing leaderboards all the way from now till Saturday. On Sunday, we won't publish the leaderboard. Sunday, we will show the leaderboard in the session. So log into the session on next Sunday to see the final leaderboard. And the top three ranked winners will be seen on Sunday on the leaderboard. Okay. So all the best to all of you. My recommendation is do one submission a day. Okay, so that you can see where you stand, what your position is and how you do with others. You cannot see what others have submitted, but you can see where you stand. So you might be at position 40 or position 50, but you now have the opportunity to make a better submission for tomorrow. Okay, so this allows you to assess yourself as compared to the performance of others. Every single day, you will see the position and you can then take actions to improve your position and go for that, go for that free seat. Okay. You don't get the free seat, you're rank four, you're rank five, you're rank 10, that's fine. You don't get the free seat, it's still fine. At least you know you're in the top 10, right? That itself is a big achievement. And this journey that you're taking with us is actually the very first step that you need to take to become a data scientist. 
And after this, I can assure you, you will be thinking like a data scientist. At the end of seven days, you look at any business problem, you will look at it as a data scientist, right? So that's all for today. Okay, thank you so much for this. Uh, we do not have a second session today. We actually did our Python really, really quickly. So we don't have a session ses a second session today. We have one hour of Python remaining. We will do this next weekend on Saturday. So the next time we meet will be 11 a.m. on Saturday. Until then, every single day, you will receive an email from us with the leaderboard of the current positions. Okay, but we will see you now next on next Saturday at 11 a.m. Next Saturday, 11 a.m., we'll finish the last bit of Python, which is functions and uh, your file IO in Python. We'll finish that. And then we immediately start with two interesting modules, which are NumPy and Pandas. NumPy and Pandas will both help you to understand better on how data is handled by the system. So whether you take image data, how is image data represented in numerical form? Okay, you can actually observe this in NumPy. You can observe how structured data is represented in a machine in Pandas. So these are really, really, so we, the, the, whatever you learned here for machine learning, NumPy and Pandas creates the basis for you to put data into an ML model. So you would use NumPy and Pandas to prepare the data to push it into an ML model. So given an image, how do I convert this image to numerical data to pass to an ML model? We will learn this next week. Okay, next week we will teach you this on NumPy and Pandas and how to do several types of data operations. So thank you so much. And I really apologize for starting late today. And I really thank you all for waiting back beyond time, beyond 1 p.m. We really like to start on time every single time. Uh, I had genuine issues with the computer. I had to reboot it. I really apologize for the delay. But thank you so much for cooperating with it. Thank you so much for coming in today. We really appreciate it. And we will look forward to seeing you on next Saturday at 11 a.m. India time. We're super, super excited for the seven days of data science challenge. So let's make it big. You will receive an email from us every single day with the leaderboard. So all the very best to all of you. If you have any questions at any point in time, just come on to Slack. You can get the link of Slack at cloud.blobsy.com. There's an icon there, just click it. You can join a Slack channel, ask us questions. You can directly message me. If you like on Slack, I'm there. You can directly message me. You don't want to message on the channel, find me, find Sankit. It's red Sankit Blob City, find me and message me. We will answer any questions you have related to this. Any questions you have, we will answer them. So please come on Slack for communication that you want throughout the week, okay? Uh, there are no prerequisites, no references, nothing. So thank you all of you and all the very best with the contest. We look forward to having three top ranking winners next weekend. See you soon. Bye-bye. Until then, stay safe, stay home and have a nice week ahead of you.